I thought we would channel Nietzsche today. Nietzsche's decided um, to make the individual uncomfortable. That is my task. So we're, we're going to go with that as our, as our task. OK. Um, so here we are, Jeff and I, right? Two hours of discomfort provided by us, right? Yeah, we wish this was us. <laughs> Um, here we are instead with our um, colleague, um, Jody Summerfield, who's from Teaching and Learning. And there's actually kind of a funny little joke that goes along with this picture that I will let Jeff tell to you. In my theory course, I was talking about race, class, and gender. And I was talking about papers that were related to theory. And I said, well, you can write a, a paper about anything you wish. You know, why do people have long hair? Why do people have tattoos in certain locations? And then I said, one of my students had actually written a paper about the furries, people who dress up in these uh, costumes such as this. And then what I realized was one of my students came up to me afterwards and said, well, I know you were only making a joke about the furries, but it kind of upset me because I have friends who are furries themselves. So then I directly went to Jennifer's office because I teach in that building and I said, all right, now I have a new category to add to race, class, gender, sexuality, et cetera, et cetera. It's now furries as well. So not to be offensive to people who are furries, but this is now one of the categories we could look at with regards to diversity. So that's why this joke came about with all of us wearing the interesting uh, con uh, costumes there. I'm, I guess I'm cheer bear. Is that who I am? Cheer bear? Yeah, you're cheer. I'm cheer. I think I'm, I'm Grumpy Bear, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny in itself. That's, that's the aside right there for you. So, All right, anyway, um, we want to just give you a quick little background of how we got here today. Um, I started teaching about diversity in my class and got very uncomfortable. I was constantly worried that somebody was going to come into my classroom and tell me, you can't talk about those topics, that's not allowed. You know, so I started to reach out and look to colleagues who are also talking about diversity and to borrow from them some wisdom. You know, what should I be doing? It is okay to talk about this. You know, how should I be dealing with it? And so I, I started collecting faculty members from wherever I could. And Jeff was presenting um, at a workshop, Why Do All the Black Students Sit in the House of Blue? Um, which is a spin-off of Why Are All the Black Students Sitting in the um, Cafeteria? Thank you. Sitting together in the cafeteria. And so um, <coughs> Jeff presented, and I was very impressed with um, his, his ideas that he put forth at that meeting. So I invited him to come and participate in a pilot project with me as part of a small grant. And part of the small grant was to have my students and the other students in the course I teach, uh, Foundations of Education, to write about diversity. So Jeff came in as a consultant to help us think about diversity in different ways. Um, we also invited um, Tiffany Hill, who was another teacher for um, the course 301, to participate in the project as well. So she's going to talk to you a little bit in, um, in a couple of minutes. Last year, I guess I was, I was on a panel that was talking about why kids were segregating themselves on campus. Um, I've always talked about segregation and how it's playing itself out within the macro level of society, but it was interesting to me that it was happening on our campus. Um, so Melvina Sumter and Janae from the Counseling Services said, would you be on this panel? And I was, and the dialogue went really well. What I found is that students really do want to talk about diversity and this idea of how it plays itself out in the classroom. And what was interesting is that we had run over with time, people talking, et cetera, et cetera, which was a good thing. But what was really interesting to me was I sat there for an hour and a half and answered questions from students. How does diversity play itself out? How, how can I talk about this in my classrooms? What other venues can we have that would uh, give us an avenue to talk about this? And I said, I really don't know at this moment. And that's when Jennifer had contacted me via email and said, hey, I got this grant from the QEP folks. We're talking about diversity um, in our projects and how we can incorporate this. And at first, I was a little bit hesitant. I'm like, what am I going to teach educators about educating people? But what I realized was is that that really wasn't the dialogue. It was what I was bringing to the table about understanding diversity, race and ethnicity, gender, sexuality, the list can go on and on. And what we ended up finding was is it was a really genuine dialogue and at first there was some discussions about what is color blindness and some of the things that we'll talk to you about today and why does this matter why is it bad to be colorblind in our society and it, it really grew into a relationship that we actually continue to this day where we're still working on another project through the QEP um, that Jennifer went out and got the grant and graciously asked me to be a part of 
And so I think that both the Department of Teaching and Learning has benefited from it, but I've, I have benefited from it as well. Um, a lot of times I was presenting things in my class about diversity and my students were like, I'm like, do you, have, do you understand this? Yeah, 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 we understand that. And then I would be engaging in a dialogue with Jennifer and other colleagues and they were saying, I don't really get what you mean. And so it gave me an opportunity to really reflect on how I was presenting these, this information and this knowledge, so to speak, and these concepts. And I've able, been able to go back, reflect, and then therein pass it on to my students. And I think they've benefited from it. And Jennifer and I, Jennifer and I have both benefited from um, the relationship and the, the research we've been working on. So I love when people benefit from my ignorance, which seems to be a theme <laughs> lately with me. <laughs> OK. Um, so anyway, the project we're working on now is related to what used to be called the QEP and is now called Improving Disciplinary Writing. So all of the students in um, six courses in the Department of Teaching and Learning are doing writing projects related to diversity and we're putting them together in a group blog so students can see each other's writing and respond to it, which is a nice opportunity. So our plan for today was to really focus on three questions. First of all, why do we need to have this conversation? Um, why is it so uncomfortable? And then how do we do it? What are some ideas for engaging in this dialogue um, in our courses? So this was the plan, um, but Tiffany, unfortunately her plans shifted and she's gotta leave a little bit early. So we're gonna switch and talk about why it's so uncomfortable first. And then we're gonna go back to, well, wh even though it's uncomfortable, why do we need to talk about it? And then how do we do it? Um, so I, I kind of put Tiffany on the spot here <laughs> in terms of um, her explaining why it's uncomfortable. But, I, but I'd kind of like all of us to engage in that question. Why is it uncomfortable to talk about issues of diversity and equity in our classrooms? And as you're thinking about it, then I'm going to have Tiffany come up and tell her a little bit about her own response to this question. When I was first invited to participate in the project by Jennifer, um, at, what was it, the spring semester? Um, just in the planning session of, of what we were going to call this project, which is now Project P6, um, one of the things that I initially found very surprising um, just in talking with Jennifer, and I think she found it equally surprising about me, was that um, she uh, felt a little bit uncomfortable about things, uh, talking about diversity to her students because she felt that perhaps her credibility would be questioned as a white female and you know the white race is typically thought of as the privileged one so um, she expressed those concerns in that meeting after I shared that um, in response to um, her proposed title or just the placeholder for the the project was African American History Project and I immediately said I'm not comfortable with that title I can't, as an African-American woman, go in front of my class, which is predominantly white, and for um, most of my experience, my classes have been all white, and I said I cannot go in front of my students and say that they have to do an African-American history project. I said because I'm afraid that I will come across as that militant black woman <laughs> trying to advance a, a pro-African-American agenda. So um, it was very difficult for me to um, go along with that, which it was a, a placeholder t tentative at the time, but um, my uh, response to that was very surprising for her because she thought that I would perhaps be perceived as more credible to my students and I just did not feel that was the case. So as an African American woman um, talking about issues of diversity, I feel that I have to begin from a more general topic, maybe um, socioeconomic diversity, maybe gender um, differences, maybe um, religious diversity, and then ease into um, racial and ethnic diversity. Um, because it's always that fear of, of mine, um, just as an African American woman, that I'm coming across as strongly you know, pro-African American um, and just throwing all the other races uh, under the bus, I, I guess. So um, that's what has always made it more challenging for me. So I, I do approach the topic very delicately initially and I do find, or, or I've found in the past that um, it helps when I am willing to put my own experiences out there, when I'm willing to discuss my own biases. And it makes my students a lot more comfortable in revealing things to me that oftentimes are very sensitive. 
So uh, it's been a, a wonderful experience for me. I see the growth in my students as far as their increased cultural competence and just their understanding um, of the need to reflect on those biases that they may have and address them um, before they go out into their classroom experiences. So for me, that has been just the greatest joy and the greatest uh, accomplishment of my involvement in this project. <coughs> I thought we'd take a minute now for you to share with us maybe some thoughts you have yourself on why this is an uncomfortable topic or if you've tried to talk about these issues in your classroom, um, why it might have been difficult or challenging. Reveal your discomfort. <laughs> We're talking about it being uncomfortable. Is that okay? Um, I've always grown up, um, I'm, I'm Mexican and I. I was, was always um, thought about as always knowing automatically how to speak Spanish, and so people always assume. So coming in that perspective as uh, people assuming things of me prior to meeting me, so that's always been a norm for me. And so um, when I started being exposed to different things, you know, going to university, going to, you know, working in different areas, <laughs> that brought along other exposures that I was ignorant of and so now I'm like okay I, I didn't be I wasn't so you know defensive or offended by things because it's just people just don't know and they need to know and then so it's, it's okay and I think if that message will help people not be as uncomfortable when they know it's okay to talk about things like this and they you know get over that defense so speaking on the person who used to be <laughs> um, defensive <coughs> Thank you. Um, I think that that's one of the things that a lot of my students say is that they've been taught for so long to talk about differences means that you think less than of someone. Well, if they're, oh, quote unquote, she's just a woman. Well, historically, that meant that we thought that somebody was less than based on their gender. And one of the things in Janice Hookley's, who is now retired, we had a really interesting discussion one time about acknowledging differences. We live in the real world, and to say that race, class, gender, and all these things don't exist is not to be real with ourselves. Now, in a perfect utopia, we would all love each other and none of these differences would really matter, but we would value differences. And I think that that's one of the things that, it's taken me a while to get to that point, but to talk to my students about race, gender, and diversity, it's really been how can we become comfortable with this? Because if we can't engage in a dialogue because we're so afraid of offending people or so afraid of saying the wrong thing, then what's really gonna change? nothing and then what we're gonna see is we may be presenting them with theories and concepts and all these wonderful ideas but what's really gonna change nothing because we're gonna be frozen in this state where there will be no chance for change or no opportunity for a dialogue for change and I think that when I teach social inequality or we go through some of the theorists and talk about race and gender and intersectionality so to speak it really gives students and I think that's why this this talk today is so important is because we as teachers can facilitate a context that is a safe space Right, I often joke students that I don't go out and walk down the street and hear somebody say something derogatory about race or gender and I'm like, oh, hey, by the way, my name is so, no. Within the classroom, it's a safe spot and we can, we can facilitate that discussion, have exercises and engage in a dialogue that hopefully will go beyond the classroom. Yeah. Coming. <laughs> so, um, I'm not gonna discuss it necessarily in the classroom, but I think that racial or any type of multicultural diversity issue is something that becomes very uncomfortable for people to discuss for a number of reasons. I think it, um, I think sometimes racism, genderism, these things are learned, right? So <clears throat> in my experience teaching in K-12 system, what was interesting was it took a lot of courage for my students to start to um, try to have a more open-minded view because now it's challenging what they've learned. It's challenging what their parents have taught them. It's challenging sometimes what religious beliefs they have in their family. Mm -hmm. And so I've noticed that, um, especially with young people and all all but primarily in, in regards to the young people it was it really unsettled their sense of identity um, because it challenged what they had grown up believing and um, and so either they would feel very uncomfortable about that or they would dismiss it with the oh I don't see color which you guys are going to talk about here in a little bit but 
Yeah, it's very complex, and that's one of the things that we'll get into later. It's extremely complex, and socialization patterns, identity being represented at a macro level, it's very complex, and I think that's where sometimes students get overwhelmed, because what is the right message, or what is the right way I should think about my own identity and other people's identity? That's why I like those original pictures. I was joking Jennifer about her and I doing yoga, right? This is how we see ourselves, in these wonderful positions and in wonderful shape, but the reality is, is that when people look at us, although that was a joke, the idea is that sometimes how we even see ourselves, maybe other people don't view us in that way. And our identity have, can play a role in different contexts, depending on how people want to interact with us. I, I had a couple up here, and this may spur more conversation. Um, <clears throat> but some of my own feelings about why it's uncomfortable to talk about um, diversity and, and also, I think, sentiments that I'm getting from students. So there's a prevailing belief, and I think it was touched on here, that if we talk about race, if we notice race, that means we're racist. And so my students immediately shut down when the topic is race because, oh, I don't see race. I don't mention race because if I do see race, that makes me racist. So talking about race is, is especially uncomfortable because that means I have to acknowledge that I do, in fact, see it when I'm living with this premise that, no, I, I don't see race, it's invisible to me. Um, you know, there's a, there's a tremendous fear on students' part of being labeled a racist, and like Jeff said, potentially um, offending somebody else in the class. Um, students deny the inequities, right? No, I don't see, everybody's the same, we're all on the same level, there are no inequities anymore. They always say to me, Dr. Kidd, hello, there's a, a black president, haven't you noticed? This is 2013, and they say to me, you know, this is your issue, your <coughs> generation's issue. This isn't our issue. Mm -hmm. you, know, the, you know, there's no problems with inequity. Um, you know, and, and Tiffany and I hit on these two issues where I just didn't feel credible. What, what do I know, right? I've never, I've been a woman, so I can, I can claim, okay, I've been minority as far as being a woman, but obviously I've never been black, I've never been Asian, I've never been, um, I've never been Mexican, right? So I don't know what that experience is like, and so I just didn't feel like I had the credibility that I wanted in my classroom. Um, okay. Anybody else want to jump in on why it's uncomfortable for them, or are you all still feeling uncomfortable? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I want to say that ignoring the issue doesn't help, and a couple of little research findings that I um, wanted to share with you here. White individuals who avoid mentioning race appear more biased in the eyes of black observers than do white individuals who talk openly about race. And that was pretty striking to me because again, you know, whites in particular, well, I don't see color, I'm not gonna talk about race, it's something that's just under the rug. And, and they have the assumption that if that's their disposition, if that's their attitude, then that will come across as not being racist. But then when we look at the data from an experiment with, that was actually done, the opposite was true. You know, um, in, a, a ch in an exercise with children, um, children who were exposed to the teacher's colorblind ideology were later than less likely or less able to identify obvious examples of racism um, in the classroom that were occurring. So we think the answer is if we just don't talk about race, it will go away, right? It'll go away, somehow get better. But really the, the research is supporting the contrary, that talking about race, talking about diversity is actually what helps get us closer to equity in our society. Um, and this is another reason I think, and Jeff and I talked about this walking over here, one of the big reasons that we've discovered that talking about issues of diversity makes our students uncomfortable is because our white students, and particularly the white males, feel targeted, right? It's your fault, you're a bad person, you're in this position of dominance, you know, why aren't you out saving the world? What's wrong with you? And so, you know, it, I think it makes, you know, in a, in a great proportion of our students, obviously, are white and white males. And so now they're in this defensive position, which doesn't prime them to be open for conversation. I show them the face of historical power in America. White males, educated, usually affluent family. And so what I've, what I've found, and I try to address this as quickly as I make the statement, is that some students, because of their race, being or gender being in the class, they automatically take a defensive stance. Well, you just presented a person that looks like me, but I'm in this classroom, I grew up on 
food stamps, whatever the case may be. I have lived not a life of privilege, but to some extent, I also tease them out to think about how maybe being a male in our society might offer more advantages. One of the examples I often use is, you know, men will often say, well, women have it just as good as we do. And then I usually, the case of talking about sexual assault on campus, and at this point, I usually pick on the biggest guy in my classroom, and I said, what do you do to protect yourself from sexual assault on campus? And they, what's the response? They just laugh and they look at me and they say, what are you talking about? And I said, have you ever even thought about this? They said, no. And so what I say, and then I say, well, women, what do you do? And inevitably, almost all of them raise their hands and they have very specific techniques for dealing with this. And so I think one of the things that's difficult in engaging in this dialogue of difference and diversity is that we need to get our students to understand that we want them to recognize their privilege, certain privileges they have. For example, walking across campus right, and the fear of crimes. But we don't want them to sit there and say that you are the problem necessarily. I always tell them that you're the solution. You're in this classroom, we're talking about these difficult things, so you can then be a voice for change amongst your friends, your fraternity, whatever organizations or people you may be in contact with. And I think that that is very important because part of this uncomfortable in the classroom is if we have one quarter, 20%, depending on the, the makeup of your classes, 50% of our students not wanting to engage, and these discussions that are quite difficult, then the dialogue never begins and we never see the change or we never really have the conversations that we really need to be having to talk about this issue of diversity in our classroom. And Jeff earlier mentioned safe zones and I wanna put a spin on that or a caveat and say that yes, it's a safe zone, but at the same time, it's a safe zone to be uncomfortable. So I do feel like we as educators have a responsibility to make our students a little uncomfortable because learning is uncomfortable. Change is uncomfortable. If we continue to believe all the same things that we've always thought, we're not changing, we're not growing, we're not learning. So I really think it is our responsibility as teachers, as educators, to create this discomfort and to let people you know, sit with their issues. Okay, I'm uncomfortable. All right, that's not a good feeling, but that's how we learn. And that's part of the process is sitting with that discomfort. Looks like we have a comment here in the back. Just a question. I don't think I need a microphone. I have a basketball. No, 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 no. <laughs> Sorry. Um, before we get uh, farther, could you define color blindness? Yes, uh, I, we definitely can. We're going to talk about it later on, too. But color blindness is saying it's the belief, and you ask your students, are you color blind? They say, yes. I don't see color. And the problem for me as somebody who's been doing, talking about this and researching this for a long time is when you say I don't see color, for people who are non-white, you're saying essentially that we don't see you. And so part of the problem becomes is if I don't see you and I'm trying to get you to value who you are, I mean self-esteem, your belief in self-efficacy, how you'll do in school and overcome obstacles. I've been told for so long that nobody really sees who I am and my identity. And so we, we could be promoting people who don't believe as much in themselves as we want them to believe. And part of the things that, and, and Jennifer and I talked about this earlier when we were walking over here yesterday, was the idea is that we're talking about race here, but the, the amount of diversity that we have on campus, right? We could be talking about disabilities, non-disabled, right? Sexuality, we could, we could go, the list is, is almost, it's, it's just could go on and on and on. Right? But for us and for me, what I find is that the, the main topics, race, class, gender, sexuality, religious preference, those are the hot topics that students are really grappling with. And I think that sometimes if we can just talk about them, then hopefully they can relate those ideas to other components of their life. But this idea of colorblindness, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while. So kind of on a personal level, it's like you don't notice race, so oh yeah, I didn't even notice that my friend was Mexican or I didn't notice that my friend was, was African American, but also on a policy level. So if you think about something like affirmative action, we have a colorblind policy, which means we don't consider race in our decision making. So you're basically attempting to ignore race on both a policy level and sort of on a personal interaction level as well. That's the underlying idea. Yeah. Here you go, sir. And again, we'll address this later on. Okay, so we're gonna go back then to question number one, which is why do we need to have this conversation? And I have about, I don't know, 30 slides or something like that. And part of this 
the slides, the 30 slides here, are the answers to the quiz questions. So if you came in um, late, you might not have gotten one, but we have a 12 question quiz here uh, related to issues of diversity and equity. So the first 12 slides, I think, are answers um, to those quiz questions. Okay, um, so here we go. Why do we need to have it in the answers to the quiz? Okay, so the first question, racial quotas are legal and common for government institutions in the United States. So my students are always talking about this. Why the, the white students are angry and don't want to talk about this is because it's all about quotas. Well, the answer to this question is actually false, that there's a Supreme Court ruling um, and that quotas are no longer legal for government institutions. So I, I try to shut that conversation down right away when it happens in my classroom. Do you want me to just keep going or you want to add? Uh, well, yeah, and briefly, you know, the, when they did the Backey decision, they said it can be used as a small part of the equation, but it can't be the deciding factor. And what's interesting is that, oh, when I was getting ready to go to get my PhD and I was leaving Old Dominion, um, actually UVA was found to be looking at who was giving money, so legacy. So one of the things that's interesting for me is you talk about affirmative action, students say, no, I, I, do, I reject that. And it's amongst all races and genders. There's, there's, it's pretty common in my classrooms. But when we talk about legacy, whether or not your family member went to this university and affords you a greater opportunity, they have absolutely no problem with that. But what's interesting, if we know the history of America, who was allowed to go to college and who wasn't allowed to go to college, legacy has a distinct, um, a very important impact on who is allowed to go to these colleges or who's getting uh, privileges. But they don't want to talk about that because that, that's not them we're living in today. And I often find that students believe that society is just add water. We just popped up today and we all came to be. So let's not talk about legacy and let's definitely not talk about affirmative action. So um, number two, the question was, um, including race as a factor in college admissions is permitted as a means to compensate for past and pre present social injustices. And so technically that's false in the sense that it's not used as a means to compensate. What is true and has been upheld by the Supreme Court is that we can look at race as a one of the factors for the purpose of promoting a diverse student body. So that's kind of the spin that the Supreme Court has taken on this. <coughs> Okay, um, what demographic has, group has benefited from the most from af affirmative action? Did anyone know the answer to this one? You knew the answer? A couple of people did say, I was very surprised by the answer. I didn't know it, so it's white women. Um, Jeff knew it, of course. <laughs> and, and the idea is that white women coming from a middle class background are able to use their class to be able to promote these aspects or be able to um, use the benefits that they're given. So. One of the things that we know from some of the, the charter schools is that we'll give you a scholarship, but sometimes your income of your family doesn't cover or you don't get enough money for the entire scholarship. So families from middle class backgrounds are able to use their income to subsidize and be able to go to these said schools. Just a really quick question. Do you think that statistic is um, may also have been contributed because maybe other races or ethnicities were unaware of what they could receive from affirmative action and so action was not taken? That could because, be a possibility. Okay. A lack I, I of awareness. I was just thinking because setting precedents on proactive parents or proactive family members may have contributed to this movement and the result is the statistics. So and I'm I think that's an incredibly important point. And the reason why is when I often talk to students about going to graduate school, the, fir the first thing they say to me about graduate school is I can't afford it. And I say, well, do you know that you can get assistance ships and tuition reimbursement? And we would just say, oh, of course. But they look at me and they say, what do you, what do you mean? Well, don't you know that certain graduate programs, we offer tuition reimbursement or we'll pay you a stipend to work for the department? No, I never knew that. So if we look at it theoretically in Pierre Bourdieu's work, we could say that some students don't have access to you know, motivation and information that would be tied to class and opportunities. And college is an opportunity where they can learn about some of these things. And I think that's a, that's a, very, that's a very good point. The reason why I was asking too is because when I taught K-12, I, I did say, you, did you know because of this, you could do this and, and, and research now. And these were, you know, K-12, you know, middle school, even, you know, high school students because you have to start young now, you know. So I would 
try to get them in a proactive state of mind at a younger age so that they could because when I was growing up the first thing my dad filled out for me were loans <laughs> you know so that just coming from that kind of perspective yeah like you might actually qualify for a, a grant so to speak because of where your background or your identity may be perhaps I think that's an excellent point and I saw somebody looking at the picture down here. This picture is from the College Republicans of Berkeley having a um, bake sale, a racist bake sale, in order to draw attention to this issue because California was trying to, once again, allow race to be considered as a factor in college admissions. And right now it's not. It cannot be considered as a factor in California. And so there was a motion to try to have it considered again, and the College Republicans were protesting that bill with their um, bake sale. So it's one of the things I talk about um, in my class. But as Jeff already mentioned, my students um, do have negative views about affirmative action. There's only a small percentage of the students that are supportive. Um, true or false, SAT scores are roughly equal across racial and economic groups. And this is definitely false. There's huge disparities. Um, the black-white disparity is about 100 points on any given test. Um, this, this, this one is a little bit hard to read. Here, if you combine the tests, you can really see how the disparities um, pan out here. You can see 200 points different in the economic groups here. So clearly, students from wealthier backgrounds are scoring significantly higher than students from more modest backgrounds. And there's obviously differences here um, by racial group as well, which suggests that maybe this isn't the most you know, reasonable way for us to be looking at how to admit students to college and that perhaps considering race, socioeconomic status might be meaningful, might be helpful, especially when we look at that data. Number five, I asked you about the chance of earning a college degree by the age of 24. So if your family makes 90,000 or more, you've got a pretty good chance, one and two. You drop down a little 60 to 90, one and four. But if you're in this group here, $35,000 or less, it's one in 17. You know, so if we think about the impact economic ha economics have on our ability to succeed in higher ed, you can see it's fairly significant. Yeah, and one of the things, even going back to the last slide and this slides, um, when the bell curve came, came out, Herrnstein and Murray, very contro controversial book in the 90s, he basically was relating intelligence to race. And and in a, in a um, income level. And a lot of sociologists have actually come back now and said, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. It's really a matter of cultural capital. What have you had access to? Part of the things that we're talking about earlier. Um, in my class, I usually give a pseudo one, one question SAT. And I say to them, if you know what this word means, you can define it, you are allowed to go to college. If not, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. And it's usually to laugh, so I'm like, okay. But I say, do you know what a regatta is? And that's very much tied to social class. And what I find interesting is um, when I taught at University of Richmond, almost the entire class knew what a regatta was. But when I come to ODU and other classes or other schools that have different, a, a larger um, diversity with regards to socioeconomic status, it's fewer and fewer students. And I often say, well, and, and again, this is the research that's saying this, is that when we're talking about SAT scores, some of the critiques of that is you're really measuring what people have had access to, not necessarily their intellectual capability. And Bach and Bowen's um, The Shape of the River is one of those books that tried to um, dismember or dismantle this argument. So are you going to tell everybody what a regatta is so we can feel like we are allowed to be in college? Anybody know? <laughs> Anybody want to get an SAT score? Yes. It's a boat race. It's a boat race. And so the idea is that if you hung out with your friends who were at the yacht club or et cetera, et cetera, which is a component of your socioeconomic status. Right. Uh, according to whites, what racial ethnic group now faces the greatest discrimination? Whites. This is, again, a really big shocking thing to me. Um, but what they did is they asked um, white and black I don't know if, if this was students, I think this is just general public here, um, to respond on a scale of one to 10, how much um, anti-race or anti-white, anti-black discrimination um, are you perceiving in the, um, well, how much do you think there was in the 50s, 60s, 70s, how much do you think there is in the, in the 2000s? And so basically it came back that white said that the anti-black prejudice was at a level of 3.6, that was the average score. And, but they put anti-white bias at 
4.7. It's, it's whites constantly say that race doesn't matter anymore, and non-whites are saying, no, race still plays a role. Now, to what extent we could have a point of debate, but the idea is that if you're trying to have a dialogue about diversity and differences, and people assume there is no differences, it's kind of difficult to begin the dialogue. It's kind of difficult. And so this is just depicting that pictorially here. So the darker lines are the black respondents and the grayer lines are the white respondents. So as you can see now, you know, they've seen great um, decrease in anti-black bias, but a tremendous increase in anti-white bias. And again, I see this as really contributing to the animosity that I experience in my classrooms when I'm trying to introduce these issues. Okay, number seven, state employees in Virginia are protected from discrimination based on linguistic differences. Well, this was an interesting one because I actually had to do some research to answer my own question. Um, and the answer really was both true and false in the sense that we are protected in the workplace against discrimination based on nat um, national origin. And that includes our use of dialect or accent related to national origin. Um, you know. The U.S. actually has no official language, which was interesting. Virginia has decided to adopt English as its official state language, um, and other states have done the same. You know, but if we look at speakers of African American vernacular English or students who have an Appalachian dialect, these are not, they're not being discriminated against based on their place of national origin, right, because they're American. And so there's not actually protection for their linguistic differences. And these groups are commonly considered uneducated or uh, less intelligent. And one of the readings that I looked at related to this issue posed these questions, which I thought were pretty striking. You know, what does an intelligent person sound like, right? What does an uneducated person sound like? What does a hero sound like? What does a villain sound like? Allison. Say something. We were talking a little bit beforehand, Jeff and I, and, and I'm pegging on what you were saying. So much of what we feel as adults, we learned sitting in front of a TV set when we were three. I'm from New York City, and everybody who talks like this is considered to be a thug. I worked very hard to lose that accent, and consequently, I think, perhaps lost a piece of myself. Um, I remember Foghorn Leghorn, the big, the big southern chicken, you know? He talked real slowly and he wasn't real bright. And if at three, sitting in New York City, that was the only southerner I ever heard. And it's a cartoon. My parents thought it was just fine. It's kind of scary to think where some of this stuff starts. I'm coming. <laughs> That's a good point um, that you made. And also, as an African-American woman, I've experienced um, similar uh, things where, say, if I'm on the phone and I'm speaking with someone, and, um, for example, I uh, needed an attorney for um, just consulting with, uh, for uh, a business license that I was trying to get years ago. And I remember when I first went in to meet the attorney, she expressed her shock that I was a black woman based on how I sounded on the telephone. And um, so often I have people say to me, oh, you speak so well. And it was my principal about 10 or 15 years ago who pointed out to me, you know, people are probably saying that to you because you're a black woman and they don't expect you to speak the way that you speak. And that says a lot about what we think of people who do speak other dialects of English. Um, and I think about my own father who does use the um, African American vernacular English. And um, you know, when people meet him, I often wonder what are their perceptions? Or when he's on the phone, sometimes he doesn't get the same level of service. And then I might call back with the same issue and everything is fine. Everybody is so uh, willing to help me. And so uh, that has been a common experience for me um, throughout my childhood, my parents would often, you know, as a child, I often would have to place phone calls for them. And they sp speak English, you know, so it, it's a very similar experience to a, a Spanish speaking family or a Chinese speaking family. So very, very similar. The, the belief in the origin, the ethnic or racial origin of your name plays a role in the amount of callbacks you'll get for a job. Um, a really famous study that was done suggests that African Americans need to put out 15 resumes for a call met compared to white 
Eurocentric sounding names. So even the names, how we present ourselves, and I think that that's one of the problems of talking about and dealing with diversity is what matters for your identity at that moment in time might be completely different for the person that you're interacting with. And it's always hard, you know, as W.I. Thomas says, what people b believe to be real is real as such for them. And so it's very difficult to talk about diversity when you have two people who are engaging in interaction. How are they seeing you? How do you see yourself? And maybe those differences in definitions of, and I've often had students who are of African American descent say, yeah, people say I sound white. And it breaks my heart because we've gotten to this point that we're relating race to how people speak. And, and I think that's a step back as opposed to where we're trying to get. Um, I, I remember being called white girl all the time by my African-American peers, so. But yet all my African-American, not all, but very many of my African-American students say the same thing, that they're told that they've acted white, yeah. right? Labeled white or other various names related to that. Okay, true or false, state employees in Virginia are protected from discrimination based on sexual orientation. Well, you might know the history of this one. This is kind of a, a fun one. So um, when Tim Kaine came into office, he signed an executive order to prohibit discrimination based on sexual <laughs> orientation. Well, then when um, McDonald came in, into office, he took that out <laughs> of the law. And so now when our um, upcoming governor, um, Terry McAuliffe has promised now to make that his first executive order that he's going to put sexual discrimination back in there. So this has been kind of an interesting political uh, tug of war here in Virginia. Okay, um, number nine, true or false, black, Latinos, Native Americans, and Asians marry whites at roughly the same rate. And you can see that the answer is false um, for this one. The least common grouping is a white woman, a white man with a black woman. When we originally looked at this data and I said, actually, I, I thought it was significantly lower because I think I was going through whatever, looking at my fantasy sports, what have you, and Yahoo said, interracial marriages have doubled, which seems, I was like, wow, when did I miss this? And then I clicked on it and actually it said that for the most part, it went from two and a half white males, black females to, to just under 5% which is true, it did double, yes, it very much so did, but it kind of misrepresented how, how much we've actually changed. It's, it's, it's a good thing, and I'm not critiquing it, but it's just how we perceive how race is playing itself out, and you know, as several theorists have said, that marrying somebody is really the sign of so, actually social change, right, because they can be a part of your life and have children with them, et cetera. Okay, number 10, what is the number one cause of bankruptcy? It's actually medical expenses. How many people got that one right? Did you guys know that? You're so smart. <laughs> okay, and this, this was striking for me too, is that 78% of those had medical insurance. Yeah, I originally included this in my, in, a, in my inequality class. I give them a quiz. And part, some of these are Jennifer's and some of them are mine because what I'm trying to get them to challenge is their assumptions. Well, people who declare bankruptcy are just people who are using credit cards who are poor people who are out of control. And I sit there and I'm saying, well, if we know that a lot of these bankruptcies are coming from people who have health issues, declaring bankruptcy, but not only that, they had health insurance, then I can get them to start to analyze society, not from an individual, my dad says, level, to more of a structural level. This is what's actually happening in society as opposed to what you believe is happening. And that's why I often call my my classes in sociology the first two weeks, my dad's sociology. Because I'll be presenting data from US Census data and they'll say, well, but my dad tells me that all poor people are lazy and want to live on welfare. And I'm like, well, unless your dad is working for the US Census data and has access to information that I don't know, maybe we can start to challenge some of these assumptions. Number 11, on average for every $1 that US men make, how much do women make? 81 cents. But this has grown, right, Jeff? We're up from, what, 60 something yes. before? And what year will it be when it's $1? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, actually, actually, I think the, the figures are worse than that, isn't it? That men to women, I thought it was like 70 cents to a dollar, but then if you're, a married, if you're a married woman with a child, it drops, maybe it drops to 70% or 60%. If you're an unmarried woman with a child, it's 50%. Yeah, exactly, and this you know, is taken into account. Really, you know, I think a horrible issue. But I mean, you know. Yeah, extreme, very much so, and for white women, 
it's, uh, it's closer to 90 cents. So there's this still, th so th the reason why I'm bringing this up is because even though we want to make there's this case that it's simply gender, there's also family structure, it's race, all of these things are playing a role and I think that's an excellent point to bring up is that yeah, for young single women, the feminization of poverty, it's significantly different, significantly. Okay, um, 12, true or false, weight discrimination among obese individuals is now comparable to rates of racial discrimination in the U.S., especially among women. Um, so I, I read a, a little bit about this, um, and they didn't actually cite any numbers, but what was striking to me was that there are numerous court cases now where obese individuals are, you know, explaining that they were either not hired or fired or asked to. And in many cases, it was women who were hired for a certain position and then told, well, listen, you're, you know, you've got to weigh in, and now you're, you know, you weigh too much for whatever position that you have. Either lose the weight or you have to be let go. And so then these are women taking these um, instances to court. And, you know, in large part, they're not being supported because there's just not the law um, to support this type of discrimination case, except in, you know, Michigan is the only state that has a law. I, I was just wondering, because I've heard um, lately that with, with the new, um, we'll just call it Obamacare, that their companies are charging higher insurance rates if you're obese or if you're smoke or something like that. So, uh, and is that promoting this type of discrimination? And, and is this type of discrimination, uh, and I'll, I'll just say, here's my bias, that it's not at the same level of um, racism or sexism or any of those others that yeah, I, I look at this as possibly being more of a choice than whether you're born black or white. You know, that's not much of a choice. So I was just wondering, you know, if, if you're, you're talking about the court, court cases, and um, I, I don't know how those turned out, what the rulings were, but it sounds like, you know, at least in corporate America, it's being allowed, if not encouraged, that you can have these, um, these scaled rates, but also just uh, other people's thoughts about whether it is at the same level of discrimination. Um, one of the things that I, and, and I think you have a, a really good point, but one of the things I try to get away from, and maybe this is something we could have a, t a conversation about, is what is more or less, right? And I think that that's when we, when we start to theorize about race, gender, and all these other things, or even um, obesity, this becomes, well, what is more? Who's more discriminated against? They're like, how is this more detrimental versus this being less detrimental? And I, and I think that the complexity of identity and this idea of intersectionality is we always make up all of these things. Our identity is all of these things simultaneously. And as we go through our life, not only are we com making up these components, but then we come into different contexts, school, work, um, et cetera, et cetera, where people are judging us based on this. And, and, and not because I'm a medical doctor, but I know that obesity can also be, or having being prone to it, could also be part of your genetic disposition. But I'm not a, don't even, I don't even know that, right? But I'm just making the case. So, so maybe to some extent where we may be judging people um, based on something, yeah, we could diet and we could do all these other things, but it could be something that actually could to some extent be out of their control, that they may be, um, their genes, et cetera, et cetera, may, may be disposition to be more, be more overweight. But again, um, one of Patricia Hill Collins' things is that we don't want to engage in this either or. We always want to try to make things on a comparison of scale so that way we don't, we don't isolate one group. Your oppression is completely worse than this person's oppression, right? And so that's, and that's the problem, though, is because we all make up so many various components of our identity simultaneously. Which one is the way that people are treating you? Is it is it your gender? Is it you know your race or how you even define your race or how people are defining race for you? So it becomes very complicated. But I think that's an excellent point. I think that's an excellent point. And if we take it down a level to school, um, the number one cause, number one factor related to bullying is appearance 
You know, and, and certainly when, when Tiffany and I read the stories from our students um, talking about their K-12 experiences, many students talked about being overweight and the kind of bullying or discrimination they faced as a result of that. And certainly this literature talked about some of those consequences as well. There was a recent TED Talk, and again, I don't have a medical back background, so I don't know, what, but in the TED Talk, uh, the doctor was saying that it may be that obesity is actually a side effect of diabetes as opposed to obesity being a cause of diabetes. You know, and so he was really Really, he was basically giving a public apology for the way that he had treated obese individuals because, again, he had that mindset that this was a choice. Well, go out and exercise and you'd be fine. Whereas the research is now suggesting that obesity is a consequence of the disease and not the other way around. Again, I don't know the, the medical side, so I don't, I don't want to say that that's the, the, you know, the truth, but it was just an interesting switch in perspective, you know, certainly for me to hear that. Yeah, one quick point, though. We're very much segregated in America, and we know that grocery stores like most of us have access to aren't in poor, usually minority neighborhoods. And not only that, those children, because of the lack of food stamps, adequate nutrition, then they're feeding their children. Uh, I, the, the place at the table did an excellent um, uh, diagram of talking about how the cost of these low cost, high fat foods has gone down significantly, but the cost of vegetables is going up. And so some parents are saying, well, to make my son or daughter feel full, I'm going to give them a bag of Cheetos. We know Cheetos are, right, that's one of my indulging foods, right? When I want to feel guilty, I'm like, oh, where's my Snickers and my Cheetos? But we don't want to give it to our kids. And what was interesting when I do my inequality exercise about living on minimum wage, my students are like, oh, I'll just feed my students macaroni and cheese that's 99 cents. And then we watch this video and within the first three minutes, the doctor, medical doctor says, this impacts your ability to cognitively develop and all this other stuff. And so the student was like, okay, I feel bad now, right? I was just going to say, I think the weight concern is a good topic to bring up. I think it's also kind of tied to um, racial demographics as well. Some people feel you know, if you're a certain race, you're going to be, or they expect you to be, to look a certain way. As far as weight and um, whether you have a control over it or not is, again, like you mentioned, debatable. And I would mention the other side of the scale being slender, from my own personal experience, People also have assumptions. You know, they assume things about you, whether you have an eating disorder, if, if you're in an abusive situation. They also wonder about your judgment level. You know, how are you thinking? How can you take care of other people if you look so thin? In my own personal experience, I'm a cancer survivor. So as a director of all of that, this is how I look now. But people are always constantly talking about me or commenting oh well you just need to eat more or can I get you a second helping or what are you doing and sometimes they don't even know my situation or they don't take that into account well this is just the reality of what it is and that is beyond my control so I just wanted to bring that to the forum as well yeah, okay. thank you thanks for sharing I think we have our bonus question here. Jeff, why don't you do this one? This was your okay, this baby. Is, this is, again, challenging students' assumptions with the inequality quiz. I give them at the beginning of class because usually responses to this are, for every one dollar that white families own in wealth, how much do African American and Hispanic families own? And what I usually get for responses for this is, well, it's about 75 cents. So black, for every one dollar that whites own, black families have 75 cents of wealth. And then if we want to talk about median savings, um, the median family, African American family in America has $300 in savings. And so if we start to think about that, there's significant disparities with regards to wealth. But wealth, as a sociologist, is long term. What you bring to the table, what your family was able to give you, and what you're able to accumulate over your lifetime. And so when I do a lecture for the Diversity Institute on income mobility or social mobility, what often happens is we get in this debate and students want to say, well, income mobility. Short term, well, my friend just got a job, he was working class, now he's middle class. Okay, that's income. What we're talking about here is wealth and long term. And so the reason why I think this is so incredibly important is the point that I was bringing up earlier. Our students, for some reason, always believe that society, we just add water and we all just popped up. And I say, well, why is this important? Well, because this is tied to long term patterns of discrimination, prejudice, based on various characteristics that people might have had. And so if we want to look at really about diversity and understanding differences, I think, again, getting them to challenge some of their assumptions about what is happening or how America operates and what we know through data and what they believe to be true is a great place to start.
because it usually is a great launching point because I get answers all the way up from a dollar, it's perfectly equal, to you know, some people have taken introduction to sociology with Meredith, so to speak, and they'll say, no, it's about 10 cents. But that's, the, t the person who says 10 or 15 cents is few and far between. I usually have between 50 to 75 cents is usually the answers, and then also related to Latinos as well. I'm just out of curiosity, what is it for above middle class or upper middle class whites versus lower class whites? It's still significantly different, but off the top of my head, I am not really sure at this moment. Curious. Yeah, yeah. but I can find that data out for you and, and send it to you. Okay. okay. Jeff and I both attended the discussion here at ODU um, in response to what happened at the Trayvon Martin case, and it was just striking for me as I looked around that no white students attended the conversation at all. This was over in Webb Center, and there were quite a number of people there, um, and I was somewhat surprised by that response and the message at least that it conveyed to me. Yeah, and this is the whole part about being uncomfortable, and I, and, and I even said my too long of a comment there Christina can speak to this, is that there really was no diversity there. I think the white people there, I mean, I'm being as honest as I possibly can be, was Jennifer and myself, and then the few reporters. Maybe there might have been a few other people, but what was interesting to me about this is that Trayvon Martin and the whole issue that happened, regardless of your views on it, was really, it's a black issue. And I was making the case that this is a, an issue of our, for our society to deal with, right? And so it was interesting. Um, I was the organizer of the event and one of the things that we strive to do is we made sure that we did not just invite black people because we did not want this to come across as a black issue since this is more it was a lot deeper than just a black issue and there was a lot of backlash afterwards after there was pictures of the events and the media came to the event when they looked in the crowds and they did just see black students so that was kind of disheartening especially because we really did go out of our way to make sure that everybody knew about the event. Yeah, and that's one of those things is people make choices. And I think it, when I, there was the, we were celebrating or discussing the Emancipation Proclamation had 150th anniversary. And what was interesting there was, is the President's Secretary came up to me and said, well, why can't we have a dialogue about this? And one of the things I said is, we put these flyers out there, come and talk about this. But it's usually, for the most part, when we're talking about race and ethnicity, that's what I'm usually involved with. It's usually the non-white students who show up. And the white students, because of this fear of being seen as the problem, are resistant to go there. Well, unless they're my students, right? No, I'm just teasing. But some of them will show up and say, hey, I'm here to, hear, here to um, see what you have to say, so to speak. Okay, this is another um, presentation that Christina sponsored, I believe. And, and so maybe why don't I just let you talk about it for a minute. So I believe it was last fall, um, Counseling Services had a panel discussion called Why Are All the Black Students Sitting Together in the House of Blue? And in Web Center, um, there's two like main areas where a lot of students are. So there's the um, South Mall, which is called the House of Blue, and then there's the North Cafeteria. And typically during activity hour is when you can see the um, the segregation, for lack of better words, both the fraternities and sororities, we all do interact a lot together. But during activity hour, we just participate in different activities. But from the outside looking in, it's going to look very crazy as to why they aren't necessarily all together. So it was a really interesting discussion. Dr. Toussaint was a part of the conversation as well. And a lot of interesting feedback came up from it. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, clarify, were the students themselves that were sitting in these um, in these areas, were they asked a question, or was it afterwards that this, the it came about? Meaning, were they like, were they asked? Um, I was just thinking, maybe that would be something interesting to do to say, why are you sitting here? You know, why do you segregate yourself? I was just thinking, you know, at the next level, that would be interesting to note. Well, I'm kind of annoying like that. So when I was getting ready for this talk, there's probably issues of human subjects, but don't tell anybody. But I was interested myself. And so anecdotally, I walked around and I said, you know, hey, this is who I am. Would you mind talking to me about this? You know, no, I, I was just trying to get an idea. And what became interesting to me is when I asked them, they said, well, you're just seeing me right now. 
I have friends of all different races. And I said, okay, well, I, I got you, that's cool. But what, why are you sitting here? And they just, and what it always came back was is that, again, it's our generation who's focusing on it, not them, as, and in the same breath, they're segregating themselves, right, on campus. And so what became really interesting is they almost became defensive of something because I was questioning about it, but I was like, well, why is this the case? And one of the things that I thought was interesting and, and just a few comments I got was, well, I'm biracial. Okay, cool. Well, then why are you sitting over here? Well, just because this is just the way that it is. Or, and so there was no, uh, to, in the nicest possible way, I don't think they were really being honest about talking about race because it made them feel uncomfortable. And then some people were like, I gotta go. Right, and I'm like, okay, I'll see, I'll see you later. Thanks, thanks for your comments. I wonder if it's so much an issue of race. Isn't there a pro proclivity for people who see themselves as similar to other people to basically be drawn to or want to hang out with those people. So it's not necessarily a, a, an anti or race type of thing as it is just, well, they, they seem to have a similar cultural, religious, political, whatever kind of orientation. And so I feel more comfortable there. Yeah. 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 So I'm not sure that's racism. No, no, no. And, yeah. and I would never say it was racism. I would say it would be just a component of who they believe they belong with and right, the power of the group to conform to belong. So, but yeah, so what, when, I, when I did ask them, a lot of them, what I found, which, which I talked about during the discussion was, is that a lot of them are freshmen and sophomores. So I knew you from high school, so we're sitting next to each other. And then what was interesting when we were at the event and afterwards and when I was talking to the students and answering questions, a lot of them who are juniors and seniors who have been in their discipline for a while, they say, well, no, I do hang out with people who are of different races, but you're right. Where I came from are high schools. We know there's high schools and education is very segregated in America. And so it was. It was, it was partially an age thing. So racism, biological inferiority, I would, I, would, I would never make the case, well, I mean, we can never say never, but the idea that, yeah, it was just, you're right. It was an affinity that I feel like I belong to this group and otherwise. Yeah, that's a good point. Another thing is I, I learned from Mitzvah. Mitzvah was also one of my consultants on the project that I mentioned earlier. I was very impressed with her comments at a presentation that I went to before and like collected her and, you know, come, come teach me about these issues. And um, part of her contribution to that discussion was, um, uh, was teaching us about identity development and, and understanding the process that students go through as they begin to understand their own racial background. And, and I also learned from, from Christina and even from her own story that she presented at this um, at this workshop and from the director of Greek life because I wanted to say well let's mix these kids up right we can't have this segregation right let's get them together and they can hold hands and run races or whatever you know and they said whoa you know slow down Jennifer you know this is part of the development you know particularly for students like you know Tiffany if you're going through high school and you're called well you talk like a white girl right you don't fit in if you're not being accepted by your peer group and all of a sudden she comes to college and there's more black girls who speak like her and all of a sudden she fits in so there's this opportunity for her to find people that look like her and suddenly be accepted in that dynamic instead of ostracized. And so that helped me appreciate maybe why this is occurring and why it's not as bad as it first seemed when I looked at it as, oh, this is terrible. Why is all this segregation going on? Well, maybe part of it is that natural process that students are going through as they're beginning to understand who they are. And I don't know if you would like to contribute at all since you're the expert in that area. I'm definitely not the expert, but um, the, the title is um, kind of alludes to Beverly Tatum's. She's a clinical psychologist and she wrote, uh, it, it's really interesting reading that um, her book as well. And I think that, yes, Dr. Robinson, they do. There's this natural inclination to be drawn to people that you feel most comfortable with. And I think the Beverly Tatum's, um, she posits that the only potential backlash from that is that we're not challenging ourselves to kind of be exposed to other cultures, to engage in dialogue with other cultures, and we kind of end up um, becoming isolated within it. So in the identity development process, you want to get to a point where you can actually, you know, surf, we call it kind of like surfing, surfing through and you can relate to others and um, you have this kind of acceptance and this inclusion of all different races. And so, but yeah, I think we're looking at a, an interesting point in the developmental process of these collegiate, you know, these college students as they're going through their career. And so all we're, we can hope is that um, 
by the time they graduate, which you were kind of bringing up, this point of juniors and seniors, there's a change, there's a shift, and there's this more uh, inclusive, expansive, and interactive experience amongst the uh, and, and, you know, um, going along with what Mitsui said there uh, about this being a sort of a, a snapshot in time, it's also a snapshot in their day. And if you think about it as like freshmen and sophomores, most likely they're living in the dorms. They didn't get to pick their roommates. They're in classes with all sorts of people and their schedule may not be truly theirs. So this may be the one opportunity w where they can associate with people they're comfortable with and they have they feel more in common with them. And then the rest of their time, it could be a lot more integrated and um, challenging who they are. So this may be their one reprieve from having to deal with reality and then they can um, have a comfort zone. Yeah, that's a great point. That's an excellent point. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Jeff, thanks. Yeah, and I can't help but think that there's another side of this too in this, if, if, if white people or people who tend to be prejudiced don't see a need to go and understand and participate with other cultures, then they're not, they're not seeing prejudice as limiting your own experiences. Like, you know, in other words, there's the, the sides like, you know, that you're, you just, you're cut off from all those different ideas and cultures and experiences and perspectives, you know, so that, and that the idea that people would not see prejudice as a limiting kind of thing for yourself, even though you're the, in the power group, so to speak, you know, it still limits you in terms of your experiences and things. Yeah. That's why their work is so significant, you know, to work with collegiate, sorry, um, to work with the college students and you're preparing teachers who are going to go into a K-12 classroom to be aware of these, to be aware of their own biases and then be able to then kind of help their students open their eyes and awaken to this. It's very in critical. So, I mean, and even in your statistics class, you know, utilizing, bringing in, how can you create, bring in kind of a, a diverse, diversity conversation into even statistics, which would be, you could easily do that, you know, but kind of as faculty, I think faculty and has such an interesting role in promoting this conversation, no matter what the subject area that you're teaching is. So it's kind of. Actually, I think there's a, there's a deeper level of this too. And, and, um, and that is, it's not just the, the physical character, you know, physical characteristics that might be more observable, but also differences in learning and cognition, et cetera. Uh, I remember having a, uh, a Chinese student in one of my classes who said, whenever I take literature courses or writing courses or after write essays, I always do really poorly because she was from China. And she said, you know, in America, it's like, I state what I want to say, I go bam, 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 and I summarize what I just told you. <laughs> And she says, in China, we talk around things. <laughs> and if maybe never really get to the point we really want to make or make it very strongly. And she said, I always got, you know, cremated on my exam and my essays because I wasn't writing to the point, you know. And I think uh, there was a session at ARA, uh, the National Research Council has uh, some books out on how people learn, et cetera. But one of the things they were proposing is a new, a, a new whole new study summary of how cultural differences impact cognitive learning. Like the stuff we do, like the Q&A stuff we do, that's European, you know, maybe Eastern European. There's a lot of cultures that don't sit and do Q&A with their kids, you know. So even the way we do dialogue, the way we process things cognitively, et cetera, also is associated with a whole lot of cultural things that I wouldn't, you know, I don't think we're very aware of those things and then we'd have to ask, well, what does that mean for the way you teach courses, engage in dialogue in courses, um, just a whole lot of stuff, you know. And I think there's been a lot of work on them more recently, but I don't know what all that stuff says. <laughs> all right, let me go on here. Um, just real briefly, I think we all heard about the bomb threat, right, uh, at Web Center. Um, as it emerged through dialogue from this Facebook site, ODU Confessions. I spent about five minutes looking at the website and then just decided that I didn't want to. <laughs> I, I really just didn't want to read what was up there. That's why I'm happy I'm not on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go ahead. Um, did you see, so you said you didn't see any of the comments or? I, I saw a few of the comments, um, but I didn't see where there was actually, I don't know if they took down the part about the, making the bomb threat, but I just saw some of the, the, the racial dialogue that was going back and forth. Yeah, it had caused a lot of um, chaos and controversy, especially because the, um, 
the bomb threat was a result of an ODU IFC member, which it actually was not. And an IFC, that's um, the predominantly white fraternities saying that the um, NPHC fraternities, the historically black ones, all they do, like they're pretty much just doing tribal African dancing over in the South Mall area whenever we're having activity hour from 1230 to 130 and just talking about how white fraternities are a lot more superior to black fraternities. So that ended up causing the... Um, the bomb threat and all other kinds of issues. And it was very awkward. I, um, being the MPHC president, I met with other Greek leaders and we had a thoughtful and provoking conversation about it. And luckily it wasn't actually someone from that community. So that was the good part about it, but it did cause a little bit of tension, but we were able to pick ourselves back from that whole thing. Um, we mentioned color blindness before, and so my students tell me that they're color blind. And I mentioned many of my African American students tell me that they've been chastised or ridiculed for talking white, and oftentimes, oh, and oftentimes um, by their black friends, right? Um, so, color blindness. Then I don't see race. Race shouldn't be considered um, in policy decisions basically ignoring um, the presence of race. And so the question is, is that, an, uh, is that an, an, um, an ideal philosophy? Is that a helpful philosophy? Does that solve the problem to just not talk about race, to not see race? And what we're going to suggest and what the literature is suggesting that it's actually just another kind of racism. So colorblind racism, that uh, trying to erase the consideration of race and the inequities that go along with race is just ignoring the injustice. Uh, and, and by ignoring it, we're justifying its continued reproduction. So I'm going to let Jeff talk about colorblindness. Okay. Yeah, colorblindness. Um, Omi and Wynette, in their book, Racial Formation, talk about colorblindness as a racial project. Racial projects are basically laws, policies that are put in place that always seem neutral, or the race doesn't play a role, but we talk about Jim Crow and all these other things. It's not really about race, it's just we're just different, right? We have differences. And colorblindness was brought about, um, the work of Ellis Cosey is really important here, that we just don't see differences. But what's interesting is that young people at a very early age start to see differences. They start to, you know, me being the sociologist and using some social psychological, you know, the self arises through interactions with others. And so if we start to see ourselves and define ourselves as others are treating us, then it plays a role. So one of the things that always happens is my students say, well, how many of you are colorblind? And they're all like, yes, and they're very proud of it. But again, what I was talking to earlier was saying that if you are colorblind and you don't see somebody's race, you don't really see them for who they are. And, and, it's, and unfortunately, it's a product of history. Because if you did talk about somebody's race in the 40s, 30s, whatever the case may be, it did mean that there was something going on. Well, not always, but just in general, if we were gonna talk about it. But today, when we come back at it, we need to acknowledge our differences. We need to, to value differences. It doesn't have to be deficient, less than or better, but it's just different. Um, I watch a lot of late night TV, as some of you do, and Stephen Colbert, he plays a, a, a position of a very conservative talk show host. That's, that's the role he's playing. And what's really interesting, I always show this clip in class, is that Cornell West, who's an African-American scholar, comes on TV and Stephen's talking to him about his book and yada, yada, yada. And then all of a sudden the, the, the point of the conversation gets to, well, Stephen just says, well, I don't see you. I don't see race. I just see a big bushy beard and funny hair. And then Cornell West says, no. I am a black man, living a free black man in America, he says, living in this world. And you are a Eurocentric embodiment of a white male. And so we need to see each other for who we really are. And it doesn't, again, it, it means that we're, we're acknowledging differences, but it's okay. And I think sometimes students, if they even say that somebody's different or they say she's a woman or whatever the case may be, there's this assumption that they may be seeing them as not equal to them. And if we're going to look at Cornell West and how he's saying it, well, we should value our differences and, and try to use it to say we're just different. That's just the way the world is, right? And, and Stephen Colbert goes on to say, well, thank you for leaving out the pear shaped to make fun of his body size, right? And Cornell West, and they have a good laugh, but I show students that clip because they've been told for so long to talk about race, you don't talk about race. Gender, we're not going to talk about gender unless we're listening to that one song that's objectifying women. Then it's cool. 
right? But if we can reach a point where we can get our students, and this is what Mitzway really was so, imp I, I thought it was just so important when we were working on this grant together with Jennifer, she brought in the stages of identity development and how, and, and I had kind of gotten away from it because I'm more of the macro level guy, right? But what I thought was interesting is that how many people are trying to identify what their race, what their gender, sexuality, what does it mean for them, but then also they're coming into messages, cultural, micro, and macro level messages of what that identity is. And so it's so incredibly complex. And so the point that she brought up, which I thought, thought was fascinating, was is that we have people on a different level of understanding themselves who are engaging with other people who, whatever this case may be, know themselves better, right? It's all a process, but, oh, I know my race. I know my history. I know my culture. And what I often find is, um, and I'll talk about this later on, is the first day of class, students will sit next to people they know or they think they're like, the power, to be, the, you know, the power to belong. And what happened was I said, you know, I'm talking about intersectionality, which I'll get into in a second, but the idea was I had two white students sitting next to each other, white males, and we were talking about poverty and the use of welfare and inequality and how it was related. And what was interesting, because of this assumption we're alike, see, we look exactly alike, the one guy turned to the guy and said, man, poor people are lazy. They, they are the problem with America. And the one young man who had the exact same race, the exact same gender, said, actually, I grew up on food stamps. My mom lived off welfare for a few years. And so what would be seen as just a very neutral, oh, it's just two white guys hanging out talking, ended up turning into a moment where I had to interject. And I said, what's going on back there? He just said this. He just said this. And what ended up happening was they never talked to each other for the rest of the semester. But that's OK. But at least if we can engage in this dialogue where we start to see each other, then we can move forward. And I think that colorblindness is a problem for people in America because we've been taught that colorblindness is a good thing. But when you're telling people that they should value who they are based on their race, their gender, their sexuality, and then we say we don't see that, what does that say to them? Right? You know, uh, a taxi cab driver I had one time, I'll just leave you with this little anecdote, said he was, a, he was an African American male. He said, I don't want to be seen as a black man in America. And I said, but, but you are a black man. He said, yeah, but every time I turn on the TV, the people who are in trouble, the people who are the criminals look like me. So I don't want to be seen as a black man in America. And it broke my heart because why? Because he is lacking who we, he, he doesn't want to value who he is. And if we want our students to believe in themselves and how they can do in school, how they can do in life, we want them to value who they are, grow their identity, their salience of who they are, who they're not, but we want it to be about them and not what society is telling them who they can be, who they are, who they're not. And I think that's incredibly important. Real quick little story from K-12. It was um, um, a white teacher teaching a class of students um, where I think it was about 60% African American. And she noticed that the students weren't very engaged in the literature class. And so you know, she, she kind of wanted to know, well, what's going on? Why aren't my students engaging in the lesson? And one of her young uh, African American students said, well, you know, why haven't us read all these white books? You know, and, and the teacher's like, what do you mean? She, she said, well, you know, and of course she's worried about being accused of being a racist, right? Well, I didn't even think about race when I picked out the stories that you were going to read. Well, his answer was, well, maybe you should have. And for me, that was like a nice little anecdote of why colorblindness is dangerous, especially you know, in the K-12 setting for teachers. Um, my personal story was uh, when I was taking a class, and first of all, my background is small town Iowa. We're not a lot real diverse in small town Iowa, okay? So anyway, I was taking a class, and at the end of the class, it was a summer course, you know how that's just, boom, you just go through it. Well, we're gonna celebrate the end of the, cl of the class and we were going to go to have some ice cream. The ice cream shop that we were going to go to was called Whitey's, spelled W-H-I-T-E-Y. And I'm talking to an African-American and, and I said, well, we're gonna go to Whitey's and go have some ice cream. She stopped me and she said, Christy, can I go in there? And I looked at her and I said, well, yes. Why would you even ask that question? She goes, because I am black. And it never even dawned on me that that perception is still there. That was an eye-opening experience for me, I, you know, just in that split second that 
uh, that encounter. And I think it's a lot of it is awareness, you know, that we just are not aware of what's going on. So that's why I was asking that question. And I think that's powerful, and thank you for sharing, because I think so many times people are afraid to share stories like that. What are, how are people going to perceive me? But that's the beginning of the social change that we want within our students, or at least hopefully, and what we want to see in the future. So, for, so thanks for, for sharing. I'll, I'll share just a brief one. Um, I'm never sure, um, I, when you were talking about the two white young men who were in the same class and they made assumptions of each other, I really object to people assuming because I'm a white woman that I want to hear their prejudices and that I'm going to agree with them. So my personal mission, I have a very strange last name. It's very hard to understand what nationality it is. So my husband's been everything. Oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. You know, my husband's Chinese. Really? Oh, my husband's Filipino. Really? No, no, my husband's black just to make people just a little bit uncomfortable that they've offended me and to think twice about who they're going to talk to next time yeah. or talk about. As a white male teaching about race and ethnicity, unfortunately, and from Chicago, born and raised, I've heard a lot of things that I wish I could never hear. But what I've done over the years is when I was younger, I'd be like, hey, you can't be saying stuff like that. And now I just say, well, that's interesting. I teach race and ethnicity. And then they're like, oh, God. And then, right, they turn around and say, I'm not talking to that guy anymore. I, I think I stepped over the line. So getting people to th just think about who they, their assumptions about who they're talking to. Um, I think, I mean, this is a great conversation. Um, I think a lot of demographics may have a lot to do with it. I mean, I was born and raised in this area. And um, I went to predominantly black schools. Um, and when I graduated from, uh, and I went to a predominantly black university for my undergraduate and came here for my um, graduate. Um, when I received a job after leaving the predominantly black in atmosphere, um, I went into corporate America and I had no, I didn't think I had any prejudice at all. So I thought that everyone was on, was on an even plane and I thought, you know, okay, here I am, I'm you know, a young person, you know, I'm going into the business world and I'm going to be successful. Um, but in the private industry, I found it to be very different. So um, I was faced with a lot of challenges uh, that I didn't know, you know, was out there. So, um, but I was open to being, um, you know, to being accepting of all kinds of people. But I was faced with a lot of uh, what they used to call and what from that particular environment I won't say where it is good old boy system so um, and it was spoken to me um, not only being black but as a woman and having to accept the culture of uh, demeaning uh, type of conversations um, and having to accept that in order to maintain a, a employment uh, so when I came here it was totally different. So I had to change my viewpoint. I was very guarded, very outspoken. Um, I would call things as they were when I was in that type of environment. But coming here, I had to change my perception. And so I became more of a you know, listener to see who are you? You know, what person are you? Are you that what they call good old boy? Or are you someone who will accept me before I say whatever it is that I felt? I need to say and um, I noticed that even with uh, someone was when you're talking about the separate seating um, I'm a soccer mom and so not I mean there are very few um, African Americans that play soccer so my daughter she's tra work, um, she's on the travel team and there are only three uh, black young ladies on the team and um Caucasian woman came to me, one of the parents, and asked, well, why are all the black mothers sitting together? Oh, I never thought about it. Um, because I mingle with everyone, to be honest. Um, but in essence, uh, one of the young ladies, she's my neighbor and also a church member, and the other young lady was alumni from my high school. And um, so I never thought about that. And um, so I reached out and started, you know, well, I was doing that anyway. Um, and I sat in different spots, but I didn't notice that people didn't come over to try, just a few, maybe one, I think one or two, would, you know, periodically come and try and sit near me. And we would have more conversations and we, would be, we became friends more so. 
So I think, and even with my daughter, and I will say this is my last thing, my daughter, she um, goes to, a, to me, a diverse school. And, uh, but she migrates to her black friends. But she has white friends at school. So when we have events, I ask her, okay, well, why don't you invite, you know, some of your white friends over you know, to your birthday party, sleepover? And it never happens. So, <laughs> but she just considers them her friends. So I don't know if demographic plays a part of this. And even myself, I live in, you know, mixed neighborhood. My neighbors are white. And um, I've invited some of their kids to parties and some of them to parties, but very rarely get invited. I haven't, I've never been invited to their parties and they don't show up to mine. So it's just maybe the demographics, you know, uh, that may play. I'm quite sure it plays a part in this conversation, too. I go to predominantly black church. One or two white people come to the church. My sister had a black business. Very few people, you know, um, you know, supported outside of her race, supported the business. So I see maybe it could be demographics that may play a part. I don't know. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And I, and, I, and I think that that's part of the problem is that it's very complicated. And if you, and if you went to college and you were never, you know, my generation when I went to ODU in the 90s, we didn't really talk about race too much. And now I'm in my class and I'm doing all this stuff and I'm engaging in this work. And so hopefully it'll be a newer generation that'll come forth. We always say that, right? Martin Luther King, right? The idea, ah, one day. And so maybe, I, I, you know, I applaud you for, you know, extending your hand. And, and, the, and the problem is, is that some people, they, they do have assumptions, right? And I'm not saying they're all negative, but maybe, oh, well, maybe it'll be awkward. I mean, just simple human interaction, maybe not even related to race. And, and so, you know, I think that that becomes the problem. And especially when you keep trying, how long do you keep trying? Or how long do you try to sit with other people? But you know, I'm a firm believer, and this is what I do in my classrooms, is I try to get people to interact with each other. And what I find over time is the more and more they interact, the more they go, we, we really do have stuff in common. We have a paper due Thursday, you have a paper due Thursday. This is so stressful, right? As they get up at 11 a.m., right? So I think that those are part of the things that hopefully over time, over time, Maybe it's just time, but I, I, I wish I had a, you know, a more clear, concise plan, so to speak. But we could talk more afterwards. Well, I, w I was going to say that maybe looking at the time, well, this is sort of an indication for us that we should move to the what can we do section. Yes, what can we do? And, but but I, I did want to say, you know, I challenge my students. I give them this opportunity to sort of go out of your comfort zone. You can define it how you want. Go out of your comfort zone. And I suggest, you know, go sit somewhere new in the class. Go ride the city bus. Talk to somebody who you wouldn't talk to. And I, I give them ideas. So one of my students, a, a white male, <laughs> and so he, he went up to three um, African-American males in front of Web Center, but he couldn't figure out how to sort of bridge that awkwardness, right? So he went up and, and asked him for a cigarette, but he doesn't smoke, <laughs> right? <laughs> so he goes up and like, you know, he's like, hey, whatever, and he's like takes a cigarette from them and just like talks, has this really awkward, you know, three minute conversation and then goes away and takes a breath out of his in inhaler, you know? <laughs> and this is a story that he wrote up for, he's going out of his comfort zone. But, you know, so I had, I had to applaud him, right? So he's trying and trying to figure out how, how to reach out, but it was this, you know, completely awkward interaction. So I think a lot of that stems from fear. You know, people are, are afraid of being rejected. You know, they, they don't know how other people will respond. And rather than take that risk, they just don't do it. Well, yeah. I think that's true because I will say this. My daughter is, is a little bit more shy, which uh, more reserved, and I'm reserved. And, um, but I'll reach out more than she will. However, my son is just the opposite. So he will go out and he'll play with anyone and they will, you know, receive him, you know, and they come over. And I mean, it's just like there's nothing to it for him. So I agree with that. All right, so what I'm going to do is flash up the other reasons why, but we won't talk about them. We'll just look at them and so that we can move to our next part of, well, what can we do um, in our classes? But I'll just leave them up for a second here. Um, 
This is, this is kind of hard to, uh, can you give us intersectionality in three seconds? Do we have a picture? Did we come up with a picture? Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, here we go. Yeah, so if we can go back really quick. Sure. Just really quick, the, the idea is that identity, and this is what we were talking about earlier, is that identity, who you are, race, your gender, all of these things, part of your identity are, for Patricia Collins, will be organized at three different levels. The micro level, biography, how you identify for yourself, group or community level context, how you see yourself and your neighbors, for example, but also how our, our social institutions operate. So at three different levels, who you are is constantly being defined by yourself, it's being defined at the community level, and simultaneously how we see our institutions operate. And what I find interesting is that a lot of times Disney films, it's a Disney film, whatever, but what we know is that gender is very much playing itself out in Disney films. The majority of the people in the background scenes are men, 75%. Something ridiculous like narrate, narrator, narrators are usually men, right? The heroes, well, they're, they're changing that dynamic, but anyways, but the idea is that we're, even at the macro level, some of our institutions are reproducing these, and they're not, and I don't think they do it in a bad way, but they're just doing it because it seems like that's the norm. And our children pick up on it. And, we, and sometimes we even, we as adults pick up on it as well. But I think this idea of intersectionality, can you go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. This is um, one of the things, and again, this list could go on for a week, right? But just what I talk to them about is when we talk about the face of power in America, and I do this thing and I talk to them about how our society is structured, I say, well, the face of power has usually been male, rich, white, college degree, heterosexual, Christian, right, or Protestant, depending on our time frame. But the idea is that when we start to look at this, you know, that is always the face of people who are not in a position of power. And, you know, if we look at the House of Representatives or the Senators, right, it's, you know, very few minorities, people of, uh, of color. But what I often say is this is part of the part where the white males say, that's me, you're seeing me as a problem. And what I always do is something similar where I will take out, I'll use women, I'll say, do we have women who are rich, who are white, or a college degree, who are heterosexual and Christian, who are also exploiting or in positions of power over others? And they'll say, yeah. So what they don't understand is, it's this idea that you are either the oppressor or the oppressed. And what they don't understand, <laughs> just as one idea, is that in different contexts, your identity might matter differently for different people. And one minute it might be your race, one minute it might be your gender, the next minute it might just be your status at work. And the, and the problem becomes is in our interactions, we have a perception of how people may be treating us, and they have a perception of who we are and our identity. Getting back to Tiffany, right, she's on the phone, oh, this is a white woman coming to speak to me, and then they shows up in her race, it challenges some of those assumptions about who she is. But this is all very complex, and we can talk about this afterwards as we cut through the chase. Um, go Redskins, yay. <laughs> um, or let's add a comma. Go Redskins, right? Um, nice Halloween costume there as the um, terrorist, or this Halloween costume. Um, bullying, cyberbullying, especially in um, GLBT populations. So those were just, you know, a million different reasons why we need to be having these conversations um, in our classrooms, maybe even on Facebook if we're brave enough, <laughs> um, but why we need to. So we talked about then why it was uncomfortable, and then we have 15 minutes less left to talk about the solution. So what do we do? How can we talk, think, write about diversity in our classrooms? And so we have some ideas that we'd like to share, and hopefully you can chime in with yours as well. Um, this is just one of many different diversity wheels, different ways for people to look at their own diversity. And I liked this one organization particularly because it talked about this, the difference of, you know, well, who are we and the inside, who are, who are we as a person? And then, you know, what are things about us that are invisible to other people? How does that affect us? But then how are other people seeing us? And what is our diversity on that level? You want to say, okay, no, so, all right. Yeah, I, I just, I liked that wheel. Um, oftentimes when we're teaching history, we're um, depicting victimization of different groups. And I think that what we need to do is make sure that we are also showcasing resistance along with that victimization. Okay, um, we talked about that resistant particular, resistance particularly from whites and white males. So how do we overcome that resistance? 
And it's basically by expanding our definition of diversity, making it more inclusive. So we're explicitly including non-minorities in our discussion of diversity, thinking about how they are contributing to diversity and can take pride in their own uniqueness. Instead of, you know, white men, forget it, you know, you're the problem, you have no diversity, we don't want to talk about you, of course that's going to set you on the defensive. So what we want to do is expand that, so how is everyone diverse? How is everybody bringing in unique perspectives? You know, and I, and I kind of laugh because the quotes that I have at the beginning, the quotes that I have at the end, they're both white European males. And I go, well, you know what? That's okay because now diversity is inclusive, right? One is Irish and one is German. Woohoo, right? You know, but but acknowledging that white men and whites have a have a, a role in this conversation too, and add diversity of thought and diversity of experiences, as well as some of the other things that Jeff mentioned in you know his little chart that we just looked at. So I think for me, this is a really important lesson for me to learn and how to not alienate so many of my students with these discussions. Just as an aside really quick, um, a lot of times when I talk to students about being white, they just say, well, I'm just white. So they're, they're identifying with their race. But then I said, what about white ethnic groups? And they're like, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, do we have people from Ireland? Uh-huh. Do we have people from Germany? Do they all, do they speak, could they possibly speak a different language? Uh-huh. But for them, it's not about ethnicity, it's always about race. And so for them, being white supersedes all these identity, identities that they're choosing, so to speak, to be a part of. And so one of the things that we can get students who define themselves as white is to talk about how ethnicity played itself out. How were Catholics treated when they came to America? How were the Irish treated when they came? How were the Italians treated relative to people in a position of power? So it gets them in a mode where they start to not only just see race, but they can also identify with ethnicity and how that played a role in people's opportunities in America. And I think that becomes an important conversation as well. Okay, um, discussing privileges. I know I've seen activities where students do a privileged walk. Maybe you've seen them as well. Students stand in a oh, students stand in a in a line, and then and then depending on um, what is said, they either take a step forward um, or a step back. You know, so for example, um, you know, do you speak English natively? You take a step forward, right? Or if, if, that, or if you don't, English is not your first language, maybe you would take a step back. So this is a, a really dramatic way to see how you know, intersectio intersectionality plays out for students um, in their identity and the privileges that accompany those different identities. Um, you know, for, for me, I was always interested in the education building. The counselors all talk about their partners. They don't say their husband or their wife, the counseling faculty. And I thought about that because even the faculty who I know are heterosexual will say partner. And so I thought that that was an interesting choice on their part to really give up a privilege that they would have. So if a heterosexual counseling faculty says, oh, my partner and I went to, you know, lunch together. So of course I'm thinking in my head, my partner, but I know that, 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 that you're married, that you have a wife. But they've chosen to say partner, so now they're on the same footing with their colleague who's gay. And so I thought about this idea of how can we actively give up some of the privileges that we have. So I challenged my students. I said, next time you go out, you're talking about your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, don't say that. Instead, say my partner. And they're like, ah, I'm not going to do that. You know, so just interesting about this exploration of privileges and what happens if we try to, um, to, to give them up. Okay, again, I mentioned this many times, asking my students to go out of their comfort zone, things I suggest like, you know, taking a ride on the city bus, um, attending a service that they're not accustomed to, homeless shelter, and this is a big one that Jeff and I focused on, which was um, having students switch seats. So why don't you talk a little bit about how that works? Okay. Um, a few years ago when I was teaching at University of Richmond, I had a guest lecturer come in and he was applying for a new position. And I knew this was going on, but I just didn't know what to do about it. But at University of Richmond, it was very much white students, mixed race, and black students. And one of the professors left and said, do you know that your students are segregating? And I said, yeah, I'm trying to figure out something to do, it, do about it. And so Pettigrew and a bunch of other people talk about this idea of intergroup contact, intergroup theory. And what I started doing, and I've been doing this, well, even before that, but the idea, what I do is about halfway through the semester is I say, look at your person you've been sitting to next sem all semester, right? Because they get comfortable. I've been sitting next to John. We don't, when he says talk in groups, eh, we talk about what we did last night, right? We don't have to do this. And then I, so I say, wave goodbye. And they're like, what do you mean? 
and I say, for the rest of the semester, you will sit next to somebody else differently in this class. And I go through intergroup theory about how we have a common goal. All of you are trying to get a good, gra good grade in this class. Some of you an A, some of you a C, right? But we also have, we, we not only have a common goal, but we share a common status in this moment in time. We share the same status of being students, well, and even me, a student, in this classroom. And what I have found over time, and the students tell me, you know what? You, you, I, and they say this in their reflections, I really didn't like you. You really made me mad when you wanted me to switch seats every day. I was comfortable and I had a good group and we talked about the articles, but, but now that I've had a chance to reflect upon it, when I walk around campus, it may not be best friends, that's not what I'm hoping, but there's a subtle acknowledgement that, hey, we took that class together and they give each other the, right, the head nod. And they say that th that increases more so and they'll, and they, and they'll get together and, and to some extent talk about me, oh, that guy's crazy, right, that he made us switch seats. But I think that's important because if we're trying to get our students to not only value diversity in the classroom and the diverse interactions, we would hope that it would carry outside the classroom. And what I have found over the years of doing this now is that it's really leading outside the classroom. My students say, the only class I still talk to most of my classmates from was when you made us do the seat switching thing and I still see those people on campus and although I don't know their names, yada, 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 for the most part I still say hello to them. And to me, that's building social capital Right, which can lead to cultural capital, ultimately can lead us to this idea of promoting more human capital and opportunities for people. And I think that it's a, it's a great exercise to do in your class. And again, the, the, and the initial response is going to be like, I don't want to do this, but we're all resistant to change. But over time, and, and again, even in my classes right now, I've already done it because it's way past the middle of semester, they're all starting to see the benefits of it. And they're writing about it in their reflections. This is, okay, I get you now. And, and that to me is half the battle. They start to come around. But you think. will have to harass them because oh, they will. won't want to move and sit next to somebody new and to sit next to somebody new each time. Yep. Okay, and this is, you don't have to read the whole thing, but the idea that these researchers did is they just had people imagine intercultural um, contact. So imagine you go and get on a bus and sit down next to an older black gentleman and he says, oh, are you reading that book too? That's one of my favorites. And you have this wonderful conversation. That if people just imagine these positive interaction, it actually improves their attitudes. So they have them imagine these scenarios <coughs> and give them the tests and they do better. So even if we don't force them to have those interactions, if they just imagine having them, there's benefits. And I can be quite annoying. Even when I did the why are students segregating themselves on campus, Christina will probably speak to this, is I was the first one to speak to frame the, the debate, which I still don't even know what I said. But I said, all right, everyone, I want you to, like church, I want everyone to introduce themselves. And they're like, what? I was like, well, if we're gonna engage in a dialogue about differences and promoting social change, might as well start right now. And the response was, no, I'm not going to do this. People, it was like church. People turned around and started shaking each other's hands, ah, 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 laughing about it. But I always believe as an educator, if I can get the people laughing, then it means they're listening and they're getting something out of it, even if it makes them uncomfortable. So. Uh, I mentioned this already. So my students, along with the students in these other TLED um, classes, teacher prep classes, are all contributing to one blog site, Seeing Beyond, where they're doing uh, exercise, writing exercises focused on diversity issues. And so this is giving students an opportunity to read each other's writing. And they're, uh, they're also tagging their writings by different demographic variables. So um, many of the ones that we've mentioned, race, class, gender, sexuality, or sexual orientation, um, religion, and so then I ask them to go in and read two people's essays that, sh that you share a trait with, and then read two people's essays that you don't share any traits with, and then to go and reflect upon that. And so it's been an, an, interesting, um, an interesting project. Okay, here we go, introduce alternative perspectives. So this is a video I found um, just the other day. So this is a, um, a Sikh, or some people say Sikh, um, Captain America, and he went around New York in his Captain America outfit, and then they interviewed various people and their reactions um, to him. We don't, we, we don't it's okay. too long, it would take the, the remaining um, number of our time. If you wanna Google it, it's a, it's a great video. You can um, Google um, Turban Captain America and find the video, and this is another, then they, then they joined um, Sikh Captain America with um, Asian Thor, Black, Black Widow, 
gay hulk and brown Jesus Christ, also known as Jesus Christ. And uh, so this was kind of just a, a fun little um, show on you know, changing our perspectives. And it was really interesting to see how people responded to seek Captain America. So this prompts us to re-examine our biases. And what I have here is a very short, abbreviated version of um, Harvard Implicit Attitude Tests. Um, and we do have enough time if you'd like to try this out. Jeff hates these tests, and I, and I think Meatsway's not a fan of them either, right? And so I th thought it would be interesting if you get exposed to them. How many people have seen them before or done them? Okay, a couple people have. So maybe what we'll do is we'll run through it so you get an idea of, of what it is, and then you can see whether you like these or hate these. So what I've created is an abbreviated um, version that we can do face to face. Normally if you go on the website, you know, you're clicking your mouse. But what we're going to do, and this is what I do in my classroom, is I say, okay, everybody warm up your fingers, okay? And what's going to happen is words or images come here are displayed in the middle of the screen. And then when the word or image comes up, you decide, does it go to the right or does it go to the left? So I just want you just in front of you to just point, point to the right or point to the left. So for example, if a picture of a white man comes up here, you're going to go, okay, point to the right. If the word love comes up here, you're going to point to the left. Now the images come, and the words come very fast, so you have to make your decision quickly. You guys ready? You want to try it? <laughs> All right, I always tell my students, don't worry, nobody's looking at you because everybody else is worried about making the right decisions themselves. They don't have time to look at you. Okay, so we're ready. Fingers warmed up. Comes, they come fast. All right, here we go. All right, how'd you do? <laughs> All right, so, uh, so hold on with, with, with how you did. We're going to do it again, okay? But this time, the words have changed, the position have changed. So over here, we have European American and good, and African American and bad. But we're going to go through the same process, okay? So point to the right or point to the left. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Okay, was one test easier for you than the other, or was it about the same? Depend on what you focused on. <laughs> okay, well, I'll tell you that for me, and I've created this exercise and have taken it, you know, I don't know, 12 or 15 times, it is still, unfortunately for me, easier to do it this time. When I do it, uh, in this version, it's harder. I make more mistakes and it takes me longer. Still, after doing this like 15 times. Um, so what does that suggest? That suggests, and this is where the contention is with this test here, that suggests that in my mind that not these words, but these words are more closely associated. Right, so that I have some implicit Bias. Now, some people, again, don't buy into that. They don't like that idea. But that's what these tests are designed to measure, so they're to help you identify where you might have biases that you might not be aware of. And we don't really have time to do the second one, because I'd like to just to have a word to say why you don't like this. But the other one that I had as an example here um, was fat and thin. Okay, now you can go on and they have tests for all sorts of different biases. And if you believe in this test, then it can be somewhat humbling um, to see how you score on the various assessments. But by all means, tell us what, what you don't like about the test. I just don't like the, the things that you and I were talking about earlier. I don't like the dualisms. I don't like that it's good or bad. Because when we start to engage in that kind of discourse, it belittles the, the shades of gray in the middle. And this test for me, as somebody who studies race and ethnic relations, I came out, I did it last night to indulge Jennifer, and I came out slightly biased towards whites. But, but I'm like, is it slightly biased who I am or because I clicked a stupid button? And what does that button really mean? For, I mean, it just means that, and it wasn't even I was significantly, it was just slightly, and I was like, well, if I took this test 10 times, what would be a better average? But for me, engaging in this either or Western dualistic thinking is problematic for me. But indulge Jennifer and I took the test. So, but anyways, that's my two cents. I could go on for a week, but anyways.
<laughs> um, so anyway, we'll click through that there. And um, most people come out, as you can see, showing a preference either strong or moderate for white people. And so that's the, that's the common result. Um, so anyway, I want to leave you with my quote by my second white European man here of the day. Um, you know, I'm asking you to go forth and be uncomfortable and maybe even unreasonable. I love this quote. You know, the, the reasonable man, of course, it should say person, right? But we'll forgive him. The reasonable person adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable person. And so I encourage my students to go out in the world and be unreasonable. Nice slide. Oh, thank there you. There you go. Yay. Thank you. Thank you for taking two hours out of your day.